So this is going to be our talk. We're going to talk about CT dose reduction. How low can you go? And I'll start off by having you ask yourself, do you know what the DLT is for your average CT abdomen pelvis? Do you know what the units are? Do you know what the number is? Do you have a sense of where it should be? Are you too high? Are you too low? Are you average? Um, if you don't know the answer to those questions, then that's perfect because that's what this lecture will be all about. So we're going to go through in three steps, review, reduce, reformat, to take from the uh, in the U.S., the recycling program is reduce, reuse, recycle. I've tuned it into review, reduce, and reformat. The bottom line will be that if you are dealing with CT noise and quality, if you have never seen bad-looking CTs, like where you can't tell if this is cancer or cirrhosis or noise, if you've never seen an image that's this grainy, then you haven't dropped your dose enough. But you have to see failure occasionally to know that you're at least within the range of the lowest possible dose. So you need to know what your volume setting is. Know what your dose is before you're able to dial it down. Because the dialing down is the easy part. It's the initiative to actually want to make a change. That's the hard part. You need to get your partners on board with that. So we're going to talk about reviewing uh, the CT dose report and reviewing CT doses and radiation exposure in general. So in the United States, there's only three states that actually require CT dose reporting on the reports. Uh, so in the minority, obviously, of who actually has to be honest about what they're doing on their studies, and it's treated like a drug. You want to give the actual dose that was administered to the patient. We'll talk about how it's not exactly a perfect estimate, but it, you know, it's better than nothing. That's Connecticut. Okay, so the CT dose report's gonna be kind of intimidating. You have to know a few things. There's first gonna be the CT dose index volume. And have you think about that as how hot is your scanner running? Is it really hot or is it running kind of cool? Like, is it really high dose or really do -dose, low dose on a slice by slice basis? So these are each representing like a slice. This is a hot slice and this is a cold slice. And this is in terms of milligray. That's going to be exposure. That will be different from millisieverts, which we'll see later. Milligray is exposure. Millisieverts is cancer risk. One thing to be aware of is, as I alluded to, this is not going to be a measurement on the report. This is an estimation of the dose. The scanner is going to say, well, these were the parameters we used. And if we assume that you are a phantom, which we'll talk about different sized phantoms, this is what the dose approximately would be, and that's, again, the exposure dose for the patient. You don't actually have a dosimeter in there with the patient, so when you see the number, you have to take it with a grain of salt. So the next most important is going to be dose length product, and perhaps this will be the most important unit that I'll have you take away from this lecture and take away from the dose reports. And what that represents is you taken, how many slices did you obtain? So you had five hot slices versus five green slices. And so this will be a product. It's milligray times centimeter. You could almost think of it like a volume. Obviously, it's not. It's two units that are kind of disparate in their meaning. But you could kind of think about it almost as though you took the, this slice and multiplied by a distance to give you a number that's the most meaningful in terms of overall exposure for that patient for that study. The longer the scan is, or the hotter the scan is, or is alt in a higher number. There's some other units out there. There's something called size-specific dose estimate that some papers will refer to. And what it is, is it's kind of like the CT dose index volume. It's a how hot is your slice on average. But it takes into account how big the patient is. So it says, well, this was a bigger patient, so we're going to adjust the dose accordingly. Or it was a smaller patient, so it's only in milligray. You can't use SSDE to calculate DLP, or at least the numbers that are out there and published. This is sort of a dead-end number. It's used in literature, but I wouldn't really have you worry about it too much. It's not going to be on your report because the scanner doesn't know how big your patient is. Not that it couldn't figure it out, but current scanners just don't do that. Okay, so what about effective dose? Effective dose is going to be your millisieverts. This is going to be your cancer risk. How do you get effective dose? Well, you take your dose length product, you take this stack of slices, however hot they may be, 
multiply it by a conversion factor, and that will give you your millisieverts. And we'll talk about what this conversion factor is and what the assumptions are with the conversion factor. So this is kind of an intimidating table. This is all the different numbers for the conversion factor, and you can see that it mathematically will eliminate your milligrade centimeter and give you millisieverts, which is what we want for cancer risk. And then this table is broken into different body parts as well as different age ranges. And so one thing to be aware of is your number in milligrade centimeter, your dose length product, will be kind of a big number, uh, anywhere from hundreds to thousands. And we'll talk about different millisieverts, but millisieverts will always be less than milligrade because your actual exposure, it doesn't mean that all of your body is at risk for cancer. So the conversion factor takes that into account. So the end result is all of these numbers are less than one, meaning your effective dose will always be less than your DLP as far as numerically is concerned. And how much less is it? Well, if you look at a baby and you look at abdomen pelvis, you have one of the higher uh, conversion factors, meaning it's about 1 20th of your DLP, meaning your DLP will be uh, converted by dividing by 20. That will give you your millisieverts, and that's on the higher end of cancer risk because you're dealing with gonads, you're dealing with young children. Compare that to an adult head, which is one of the lowest conversion factors. And in this one, your DLP is divided by 500. So you could have the same DLP, and depending on where it was delivered in the body and to what type of patient, you can have a pretty high uh, cancer risk or a pretty low cancer risk because there aren't that many organs in the head, for example, that are prone to cancer. So takeaway is at any given dose, kids are up to 25 times greater cancer risk. They have more lives, to, more um, years to live, so more chance of getting that cancer in their lifetime. Now, what does this data assume? So I've alluded to phantoms. There's only two different phantoms. There's what's called the body 32 and the head 16, and they're that centimeter in uh, diameter. And the body phantom is meant to represent sort of chest abdomen of the average adult, and the head is sort of the average adult head size. The head 16 phantom is obviously used for the adult head, but it's also used for all of the pediatric doses. Basically, this table assumes that all babies and all of their body parts are the same size as an adult head, which obviously is not true, but for the sake of simplicity, this is the assumption that has been made, and it's something that you should be aware of when you look at the numbers. Adults, of course, then, for the body family, the body 32, will be just these three conversion factors, and that's it. Okay. So as I alluded to, you should just look at the DLP. That gives you your best sense of what dose did my patient get for this study. And I would say that, especially for an abdomen pelvis, uh, which is going to be a higher cancer risk, I'd have you consider trying to keep your kid doses under 200 milligrade centimeters and try and keep your adults under 500. The rest of this lecture will be talking about how to achieve that, but these are the numbers that I would have you memorize. They're not perfect. I kind of came up with them based on our own data. And if people have feedback, obviously, please let me know. So let's talk about that report. The report has a lot of things on it, but now we've kind of learned about what the different contents are. So let's take it line by line. The scout, it doesn't have any numbers associated with it. it unless the machine is spinning, it's not going to give you an actual dose. But obviously, the scout does have a dose that's non-zero. It's just not something that's reported. The scan range will be for a study, a series that actually does something, will be from where to where was the spiraling scan performed. This will be your CT dose index in milligray, your dose length product, which is the product of these two different things. And then this tells you what phantom the technologist has entered into the system. And there's only two options, the body and the head. Okay, so in this patient, this next series, they're actually spinning. They're going from station 35 to station 310. And we have a CTDI. This is sort of how hot it was. It was 6.2 in hotness. And you multiply that by this number to get about 200 with their DLP. They plugged in a body 32 phantom. 
So already, I told you you want a standard 500. We've already bought ourselves 200 with this first series, so hopefully we don't do too much more if we want to stay under that recommended 500 threshold. One thing to be aware of, what would be happening if the technologist erroneously, let's say this was a CT abdomen, they correctly here put body 32, but what if they put the smaller head 16? What would that mean in terms of the dose? Well, what that would mean is that the same amount of dose delivered to a smaller structure, the DLP would be spit out at 400. So if they had put in a head 16, it would say 400, but whoa, that was a big number. Hey, wait a second, they put in the wrong phantom. This number is off. So you have to make sure that the technologist has chosen the best phantom for the patient study type. Now, what if the patient was actually bigger than 32 centimeters? This is a big patient. You say, hey, this dose is kind of high, but it turns out if that amount of dose is delivered to a larger area, think about it like dropping uh, food coloring into water, uh, it would be more dilute, so the actual dose would be lower. And then, of course, the converse of this is what if the patient is actually a baby and they are definitely not 32 centimeters diameter waist, that's higher, meaning you're giving the same amount of dose to a smaller body area, so it's a higher concentration of dose. So depending on whether this was entered correctly or not, depending on whether the patient actually is the size of the phantom, you can get doses that in reality are higher or lower than what's reported here. So again, this is not a measurement, this is an estimate. Okay, we do another series. I don't know why we labeled it 200 and not three, but that's what we labeled it. This time is axial, and notice how it's not going anywhere. Uh, so what is this? This is gonna be a smart prep for a timing bolus. Notice how it's a much lower dose because it didn't scan very far distance. This is just the dose that was delivered to the slice that was used for the timing. And again, this is gonna be a smart prep for a timing bolus. These don't contribute too much to dose. Okay, now we are on to another helical phase. So this one is the same 35 to 310 as we did before. Notice though, notice how this number is a little bit higher than that one. Well, why would that be? And this is kind of like Sherlock Holmes, you figure out, you know, what study actually happened. You don't even look at the images and you can figure out what they did. Well, this is gonna be a little bit higher because they've given contrast now. And because the energy is a little bit higher to punch through the extra iodine in the system, this number is going to be a little bit higher, which is why then the DLP of our post contrast is 220 instead of 200, so you know, about 5% higher than it was here. Okay, we've done now another phase, but this one went further. So this is probably going into the pelvis. Notice how the average hotness didn't go up that much. Because again, it's sort of just the average hotness or energy of any average slice. It is a little bit higher, and why would that be? Well, if they dipped into the pelvis, they would have to go through the pelvic bone. The dose would have to go up for that, and so this is a little bit higher. But this is much higher. This is almost twice as much. It's almost 400, and that's because we did more. Not because of the average dose going up a little bit, yes, but mostly because we're just scanning more body parts. This study will do one final phase. Again, the fact that it's labeled funny, that's kind of scanner dependent. Here we've gone back to our 35 to 310, so we're just repeating the abdomen now, so we're probably dealing with a delayed venous or maybe a urographic phase. And so that dose, again, is pretty much identical to what it was before with a similar amount of contrast still in the system. So what did this study, you know, we've kind of alluded to it, but now you can figure out, just looking at a report, what someone did. This was a non-con abdomen. We did a smart prep. We did an abdomen arterial, an abdomen pelvis venous phase, and then an abdomen delayed phase. All of these doses you now have to add up together for a total of 1,000. So we've gone way over the 500 recommendation. Now, in fairness, it's going to be hard to ever achieve the 500 goal if you're doing multiple phases of scanning. So as we'll talk about later, not doing so many phases will be a key part of keeping your doses down. Obviously, the less you do, the less the dose will be. There are tools out there, free and for purchase, that allow your CT doses to be pulled from the DICOM data and plugged into your report so you don't have to enter it yourself manually, um, which is a nice feature 
but it's a little bit also kind of like speed dial on your phone that if you never have to actually manually enter it, you're never thinking about it on each study. It's sort of just something you know is happening in the background, and you're not going to be as critical about the doses. So if you are using automated dose extraction, I would say you should still look at that number on every report to have an idea of, well, how much did we actually give to this patient so that you have a clue of kind of what your average is. This graph says, what is effective dose uh, versus DLP? So cancer risk versus radiation exposure for different age patients. And you can see at any given dose, younger patients will have a higher cancer risk. And to put these numbers in perspective, this is going to be a, a plane flight across the Atlantic Ocean, and that's about 0.05 millisieverts. Compare that with just all-cause exposure per year is about three millisieverts. Now, that's kind of a useful benchmark. It's arbitrary, but if we were to try and at least stay under a year exposure, we would be dealing with this kind of range here. And you can see that in kids, you top out and hit three millisieverts earlier than you will with adults. So adults, in this full range of DLT, you're not going to worry about going over this three millisieverts. Again, not that this is some scientific threshold, it's just arbitrary, our annual all-cause exposure, but at least kind of to put it into perspective, especially if you have to counsel patients about what these doses mean compared to what they do every day. There's huge variability in the effective dose depending on where you work. So this is just data from the Bay Area showing that I told you, you maybe want to stay under three, and you can see that across the Bay Area, you have multiple years worth of radiation exposure up to uh, 100 millisieverts at some institutions within the same region of California. And when you get to these really high doses, now you're talking about some actual numbers in terms of cancer risk. Now this assumption here, when you get up to kind of 100 millisieverts, estimated about one cancer extra per 100 patients that otherwise would not have gotten cancer. This is all assumptions from Hiroshima data, which many people fairly acknowledge is not perfect. We are dealing with small radiation doses. We are not dealing with atomic bomb doses, but the information and long-term follow-up that we have from the Hiroshima data is all we have to work with. And if we assume a linear threshold model, meaning any dose is harmful, which may or may not be true, but if we assume kind of a reasonable conservative, eh, not necessarily the worst case scenario, but let's be conservative, we're talking about uh, higher cancer risk at these higher doses. And I already told you that kids have an even higher risk of cancer than adults. So how do we get these doses down? So obviously there are some zero radiation solutions, you know, just don't use the CT scanner. Um, you know, just admit the patient, observe them, close follow-up. You know, it may not be satisfying to not get the answer right away, maybe frustrating to not be able to exclude things right away, but if you can achieve that without doing a CT scan, you've saved costs to the medical system and you have saved radiation exposure to the patient. The downsides, you may miss things. Sitting on a patient, maybe you should have just gotten the CT scan, and maybe you're worried that a jury will one day say you should have done it, and now you're in a lawsuit. So these are real concerns of, you know, not getting imaging tests that you're thinking of getting. Ultrasound is great, especially in kids. It's first line of defense for a number of diagnoses, appendicitis, intussusception, gonadal torsion, septic arthritis, premature brain. Uh, all of these can be adequately assessed with ultrasound, and you never need to get, and in some cases should not get, a CT scan, so that's great. Disadvantage of ultrasound is that the pictures aren't always perfect. Bowel gas gets in the way. Maybe your sonographers aren't available 24-7. Maybe your sonographers are not comfortable with kids or that particular body part. But there's a lot of variability because it's such a user-dependent operation. What about MRI? It's also first line for a number of indications, brain, spinal cord, enterography, osteomyelitis. The trouble is it's expensive, it's not always available, the scans take so long, so you can't get that many patients through per day. You've got your outpatients, your inpatients, you may require anesthesia to hold still that long. You may not be able to do it because you have 
you know, pacer wires from your cardiac surgeries when you were a baby, and you may not have people comfortable reading the MRI uh, that's generated. So MRI isn't perfect. There is no perfect imaging test. They're all complementary. So let's talk about some low radiation options, reducing our CT dose. So first off, this was the example we showed with all of the different phases. I would say in kids, do not use multiple phase scanning. I would say about once per year and only at the request of usually a surgeon who's thinking about doing transplant surgery, do I ever do multi-phase CT scanning with kids. It's pretty much never indicated. You don't scan multiple phases, you will linearly decrease your dose. So that's an easy thing to do, but you have to be prepared for this. If someone comes through your ED and they're a kid, you don't want to just slap on the adult protocol, which involves multiple phases. You know, Just because the kid has hepatitis, you know, ordering physician says, oh, I want a liver CT, and that buys them these multi-phase studies that you use in adults. Again, multi-phase is not useful in kids. Multi-phase liver in adults, what is that for? That's hepatocellular cancer. Multi-phase in kids for liver, totally useless. Targeting your field of 